Okay, so uh, it would be simple to say that you know workers uh, earn a wage, and then we just leave it at that. Um, unfortunately, though, uh, this simple statement conceals entirely way too many uh, underlying factors that are extremely relevant. Okay, uh, one mis one general statement that we can make. Uh, is that the actions of buyers of labor and sellers of labor and the interactions of these people is going to set prices for all kinds of labor services. Okay? Uh, in the broader sense, these prices provide information to the market as to the relative scarcities and wants of societies. So if we think about it, right, if we see the salaries of, let's say, doctors rising, okay, so doctors are now getting paid more, well, that tells people that there's more need or demand or desire by society for doctors. And so what that will do right, is it will induce some people who were thinking, oh man, you know, I don't know, do I want to be a, a lawyer or a doctor, right? And if you see salaries for doctors going up and salaries for, for lawyers staying the same or as they're actually doing going down, right? Uh, <clears throat> what, you, what you might do is say, okay, well, you know, as much as I want to be a lawyer, uh, I would rather go be a doctor. Right? And, and so the benefit of being a doctor would go up, and as a result, more people would go be doctors. Right? Uh, and this is the same exact thing as the corn and soybeans example. So if we see the price of corn rise, it's not surprising that we see farmers plant more corn. Right? And if we see the price of soybeans fall, it's not surprising that we see uh, farmers plant less soybeans. Right? These are not mysteries. Okay? And it's the same thing with work. Okay, if you see uh, a profession becoming increasingly valuable, you want to go jump in on that, right? And if you see it becoming less valuable, well, you might think twice about jumping into it, okay? I'm not trying to say, you know, go maximize money and, and do that. Uh, but what I am saying is, is keep in mind uh, that your salary is a function or a part of what you get out of your job, okay? And so... Uh, there's lots of, but there's lots of other ways that we get paid. And so let's talk about a few of those. Okay, so real quick, uh, the wage rate, right? Uh, this is the number of dollars that uh, people earn per hour, right? Very simple. Okay, uh, but there's two different versions of this. There's the nominal which is uh, the number, right? It's the number of current dollars, uh, number of dollars, not ignoring, uh, or not taking into account inflation, right? And then there are real dollars, or real wage rate, I should say. Uh, the real wage rate uh, is a measure of the number of dollars uh, that attempts to take into account inflation. So uh, this you know, does take into account okay. uh, and one of the, the easiest ways to do it is to think about how many labor hours it takes to purchase something. Because if you think about it, if you're getting paid a certain number of dollars per hour, and then you spend those dollars on things, right? That means that you effectively traded hours of service for the thing, right? The dollars are sort of the intermediate thing. And so if we think about this, let's say, <clears throat> let's say I earn, let's say I earn hundred dollars an hour. I wish I did. Uh, unfortunately, I don't quite, uh, but maybe someday, right? Not today. Uh, and let's say that this sweater I just bought was $200, okay? So if I earn, hundred dollars an hour and this sweater is two hundred dollars <throat> then that means this sweater cost me two hours of my time okay and so we might concern ourselves with well how how many hours of work do things cost today versus you know a hundred years ago or 50 years ago okay and so what I give you guys in the notes is a breakdown uh, of round-trip airline tickets from New York to London uh, from 1969 to today Okay, so in 1969, a first-class ticket uh, from New York to London cost $750, okay? Now, the real price in, in 2013 dollars uh, would be, you know, $4,700 or almost $4,800, okay? Uh, and this would take, you know, 246 
uh, labor hours uh, today to buy. So people would have to work 240, the average person, the average person would have to work uh, 246 hours to afford one ticket, okay? One first class ticket. Uh, an economy class ticket uh, only cost 138 hours uh, in 1969, okay? Uh, but today, <clears throat> we've become much more productive, um, and and people are, uh, we've, we've lots of advancements in technology and such, uh, and today, a first class ticket costs only 163 hours of work, right? So that's a huge reduction. Remember, uh, it was, in 1969, it was 246 hours. Today, it's only 163 hours. A lot, to be sure, uh, but nowhere near 246. And an economy class ticket is a mere 46 hours. So the average person can afford to fly a round trip from New York to London after basically a week and a half of working. And that's a tremendous discount from before. Before, it would take uh, over a month of working to save up for just one trip, and now it takes just over a week, right? That's a huge difference, okay? And so things are becoming cheaper in part because we're getting better at making them and there's more people uh, trying to fly from New York to London, so the supply curve has shifted out. Um, but it's also the case that we as people are, are much more productive than we've ever been in our entire history, okay? And so there's lots of things that go on there, but the num thinking, thinking in terms of how many hours do I have to work in order to buy whatever it is, is a very useful measure for thinking about the cost of things, okay? You have to give up your time to your boss, and then your boss gives you dollars, and then you give those dollars to the store. So effectively, you give up your time to your boss, and you get things, right? And that's fundamentally how society works and how the labor market operates. Now. Uh, obviously, uh, there are lots of ways that people get paid, uh, which you guys uh, are either aware of or you will soon become aware of once you graduate from Ferris. Uh, there's lots of ways that, that we can be paid. So typically, uh, we're paid a salary, right? So set, some set number of dollars uh, that you guys get or that we get that we can spend on whatever we want. Uh, but employers will often also include uh, health insurance and retirement or pension plans, right? And sometimes, you know, your employer will match up to a certain amount and there's all kinds of weird uh, things going on there that frankly, I don't really understand. Um, I am in a, a lucky position where I, I never plan on retiring and so I've never had to think about retirement. I, I plan on working this job until I die. And so, uh, but mostly because it's fun. Right, and so uh, don't ask me about retirement accounts. Don't ask me about 401ks or Roth IRAs or anything like that. I, I do not know the answer. I defer uh, to my finance colleagues. They can answer the questions. I can't, okay? So uh, I get that question all the time at this chapter. I don't know the answer. Don't ask me. And the only reason I don't know is because I'm not in a position that I ever want to retire from. So, uh, but there's lots of other ways that people get paid or workers get paid. Uh, some people have company cars. Right. Uh, some people have company cars with a gas card. Right. So the company will even pay for uh, your gas. Other companies will pay for your cell phone or they'll give you paid time off. Uh, they'll give you a gym membership, uh, stuff like that. Those are somewhat obvious, uh, but other forms uh, aren't as direct or obvious. Right. So uh, one of those is like the quality of your office. Right. So some people uh, just really like having uh, a nice office with, you know, uh, great furniture or, you know, the corner office, right? If you think about uh, how happy the person with the corner office usually is, they're like, yes, you know, or having, you know, an office on a higher floor, right? So in, especially in, you know, New York or Chicago or anything like that, the top floor corner office is a great office because it has a great view, all kinds of stuff, right? That's another way that people get paid, okay? Um, or, you know, maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe the, the key to the private bathroom, right? So uh, Ferris has a faculty-only bathroom, right? And, you know, here's the key to it, right? It's, uh, it's one of these. It's this one, right? Here's the key to the faculty bathroom, okay? It's nothing glamorous, but you guys aren't allowed to go in there, right? Which means there's a bathroom on campus that's right by my office that's convenient and always uh, clean and basically always empty because only 25 people get to use it great okay uh, so Ferris pays me in bathroom privileges right um, <clears throat> other people 
get paid in you know more prestigious sounding titles. So if you notice, uh, if you've been tracking any of this or thinking about it lately, uh, it seems like there's a lot more you know executive vice presidents of something, right? And so like you know, oh, I'm the executive vice president of waste management on the fourth floor southeast corner, right? Like, okay, so you're uh, the guy in charge of the trash on the fourth floor in the southeast corner? Great. And they're like, no, I'm the executive vice president. It's like, yeah, you are. You're the janitor. Got it. Right? Not to disparage you know, janitors or anything. That's great work. Uh, but, you know, executive vice president, title inflation, you could call it, uh, is a real thing. Uh, my dad suffers from it. Uh, he refuses to believe that he's suffering from title inflation, but you know, that's okay. Uh, we all have our own delusions and, uh, dad, if you're listening to this, I love you and I'll talk to you later. Okay. Uh, but you know, there's, there's all kinds of things. So for example, uh, with me, I have an office in the business building. It's uh, room, uh, 337, right? Which is, it says in the syllabus. Uh, it's, you know, it's not bad. Uh, it's got decent furniture. I'm actually up for a new computer this year, so I'm really excited about it. Um, but, you know, it, it could be better, right? And, and one thing I would be willing to do uh, is is trade some of my salary uh, for the right to use the conference room, which is right down the hall. Uh, it's twice the size of my, build, of my current office, at least, maybe even three times. Um, it's got windows. My current office doesn't have any windows at all. Um, and it's nicer, you know, everything in the room, in the conference room is much nicer than everything in my office. And I would trade some of my salary for that, right? Uh, and so, you know, as a result, uh, looking only at your hourly wages or your annual salary uh, fails to capture the full amount that you're being paid, right? Uh, if we think about this, so the, the great example of this is actually Steve Jobs, right? So Steve Jobs uh, only made $1 per year from Apple right? One dollar a year, right? Now, for the most part, you know, he wasn't living on one dollar a year, right? But then if he was only being paid a dollar a year, where did all his other stuff come from? Well, you get company turtlenecks and company jeans and company house and a company phone and a company computer and a company car and a company plane, right? And company eyeglasses and, and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, well, yeah, you're making a dollar a year. Congratulations but you're getting a whole bunch of other stuff too, okay? Now, for the most part in this class, we're gonna be talking about dollars, okay? And so what we're doing there, when we're talking about dollars, and what I want you to keep in mind, is we're gonna be talking about what's called the monetary equivalent, which is basically saying, uh, I'm gonna find the dollar value of this thing that you're being paid. So let's say it's a company car and you value having that company car at $2,000 per year. So I, I know that $2,000 and the car are essentially the same thing to you, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take that $2,000 car and add it to your salary, right? And so if you're making, let's say, 10,000 a year and you've got a $2,000 car, well, you're basically being paid $12,000 uh, per year. Now, as it turns out, there's lots of advantages uh, to paying people in in fringe benefits, if you want to call them that, uh, particularly health insurance, by the way. Uh, and we're going to talk about that later on in the semester. But for right now, I just want you to be aware that there's lots of different ways that people get paid and that they these things are worth some number of dollars, which we can add to that person's salary. But their salary alone uh, does not capture everything. Okay. Now, <clears throat> moving on, if you think about it, like we were saying before, uh, businesses must simultaneously ask and answer, you know, what should I produce? And how should I produce it? All right? They want to know what should they make and how should they make it. Okay. And what a firm uh, should produce, right, is, is based on market conditions for various goods, right? So thinking back to our farming example, uh, if you have 100 acres of land and you can grow uh, either corn, corn or soybeans, you know, how many acres should you dedicate to corn and how many should you dedicate to soybeans, right? And we can solve this problem just like we talk about in the, in the notes, right? Uh, you know, if we make a whole bunch of simplifying assumptions about corn and soybeans and how to, how to harvest them and everything, um, you know, we can recognize that, you know, you should plant the crop that yields the most 
profit, right? Uh, and so you do that, right? Uh, but, you know, we'd also want to determine uh, whether we should use a large amount of workers and only a couple machines, uh, or should we use only a couple workers and lots of expensive machines, right? So imagine you have, you know, five workers. All right, and this is where I reveal uh, my abysmal artistic skills. All right, so if I have five workers, all right, here's my five workers, um, and they each have, you know, hand tools, so I'm not going to draw hand tools because it turns out I'm even work worse at drawing uh, hand tools than I am at drawing people, right? Uh, let's say they each have uh, hand tools, and each one costs a hundred dollars each or you know five hundred dollars total All right five workers times a hundred dollars each leading mathematicians uh, tell me that five times a hundred is five hundred okay <clears throat> and so uh, there we are alternatively I can hire uh, one worker one uh, worker and let's call this a tractor which is a square with another square on top of it and some circles for wheels and it probably has an engine block somewhere. Uh, yeah, there we are. That's a tractor. Okay, so I can hire one worker plus a tractor and this guy, this combination costs a thousand dollars. Okay, and uh, let's pretend that both of these are equally productive Okay, and get the job done exactly as well as the other in exactly as much time, right? So there's no difference. You are completely indifferent between hiring these guys and hiring this guy, okay? No difference whatsoever, okay? <clears throat> Which one would you pick? Would you rather hire the five workers for $100 each or the one guy with the tractor for $1,000, okay? Well, the obvious answer uh, is this one, right? You're getting your farm plowed or whatever's going on, uh, for $500 instead of for $1,000, given that you want to uh, reduce your costs as much as you can, right? You save money by hiring the five workers, okay? And so at some level, uh, the wage that prevails, and, and by the way, what's the highest you'd be willing to pay these five workers, right? So what's given that these are your two options, this person will not work for anything less than $1,000. What is the maximum you'd be willing to pay? And let's say you have to do this. You have to pick one of these. Okay, so not doing is not an option. Uh, let's say that you know you have these two choices. You have to make one of them. What's the highest value that these five people could charge you? Well, they could charge you all the way up to nine hundred and ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents, and you would still pick them, right? Because this number is still smaller than that number. Okay. <clears throat> so at some level, uh, the wage that prevails and the and that workers receive will be determined by their opportunity cost. If someone else is willing to pay them, you know, a higher wage than they're currently earning, uh, then their opportunity cost of working on the farm, or for you uh, in this example, uh, will have risen. And so if we want to keep employing them, we're going to have to cover their opportunity cost by paying them at least as much, if not more, than the value of their next best alternative uh, source of employment. Okay, so let's think about, um, you know, let's say uh, you're currently making uh, $15 an hour working your, your job, and I come up to you and say, you know, hey, uh, I'll pay you $20 an hour to come work for me instead, right? Well, what are you going to say? Well, I hope you say yes, right? I, evidently, I value your uh, hour of time uh, more than at $20 an hour, or at least more than that, right? And so, uh, and so hopefully you come work for me. Well, if your current boss wants to keep you, uh, now they have to pay you at least $20 an hour. Otherwise, you're going to come to me, right? So that's all we're saying there is that if someone comes up to you and offers you a higher paying job, then your current worker, your current employer, excuse me, uh, your current employer is going to have to match that. And if they don't match it, you leave, right? That's all we're saying. Okay, so it's fancy economists speak uh, for basically saying, uh, I got an offer, so you either give me a raise or I'm walking, okay? But what we're, one thing we're going to leave uh, undiscussed, at least for now, is the idea <clears throat> behind being underpaid 
or overpaid. Okay, so we're going to leave that part undiscussed. That's going to come up much later on in the semester. Okay, the, the idea of being underpaid or overpaid. Okay, but what we're going to do right now is I want to talk about this. So the basic insight here is that no one is ever underpaid or overpaid, right? Ever. And that's a weird thing, okay? And a lot of people don't like when I say that because they don't like how much they get paid and feel like they should be paid more, okay? And I've just said that, you know, basically, no, you shouldn't. Like, your claim is that you're underpaid, and I just said, no, you're not, okay? So a lot of people dislike that. And let me go through sort of a logical explanation for it. And we'll come back to this later on in the semester with a more rigorous treatment and a more thorough discussion about whether or not this is actually true. Okay, but for right now, I want to put this here. So let's say uh, that you are currently being paid $10 per hour and you produce, so you're paid $10 per hour. Uh, you are producing $20 per hour which means your employer is extracting $10 from you, okay? So if you're producing $20 worth of stuff per hour and your boss is only paying you 10, that means your boss is making $10 an hour off of you, right? That seems kind of unfair, okay? And I agree, not denying, okay? <clears throat> now, if this is true, if you truly are producing $20 worth of value per hour and you're only being paid 10, well, I could come in and say, hey, you know what? Why don't you come work for me for $12 per hour, right? You're still producing $20 per hour, and I am now getting $8 out of you, okay? But before I was getting zero, okay? So now I'm getting eight, which is less than the 10 that your old boss was getting, right? But now I get eight, and I used to be getting zero, and so it's worth it to me. Now your old boss might see this and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right? I'm not, I don't want to lose my worker. Tell you what, I'll give you $14 per hour. Now you're still making, producing $20 an hour worth of stuff, which means your boss, your current boss, or where, you, where you're currently residing, now only extracts $6 from you. Okay? But his alternative is to extract $0 from you, and 6 is a bigger number than 0, and so if I threaten to hire you away, <coughs> Excuse me. If I threatened to hire you away, your boss would actually give you a raise because he wants to keep you. Because look, making six dollars, it's not as much as making ten dollars an hour off of you, but six is still bigger than zero, right? And I might counter and say, you know, I'll bid, I'll bid sixteen, right? And as a result, you know, I, I get four dollars out of you, right? Uh, let me actually, we'll make this clear. So if I circle it in red, this is your original boss, and anything not circled in red is uh, is me, okay? And then your original boss, right, he comes in and says, oh, no, 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 I'll give you $18 an hour, right? So now your original boss is only getting, you know, $2 an hour out of you, right? And then I might come in and say, okay, look, fine, I'll give you $20 per hour, at this point, I am indifferent between hiring hiring you and not hiring you, right? I don't care. But importantly, the other guy doesn't have you, which is good, okay? Your old boss isn't going to go higher than this, right? Your old boss would not say, well, fine, I'll pay you $21 an hour for your $20, because then they'd be losing a dollar every single hour from hiring you, All right? So if they did that, so we we understand that no one's going to overpay for you. And at the same time, as long as you have an option of another employer, no one can ever really underpay you either. Because if they were underpaying you, someone else would come in and hire you, right? And they'd give you a raise, and they'd keep doing that, right? That bidding would go back and forth, right, until you got up to $20 an hour or close enough that the, the, the risk isn't worth it. Okay, we'll talk more about that risk thing later. Okay, but the point is, if you are truly being underpaid, if someone is truly being underpaid, 
someone else, some other company, has a very strong incentive called, you know, the profit incentive here to hire you away, to give you a raise, to induce you or convince you to come work for them, okay? And so if you believe that, if that seems true, if that seems to make sense to you, right, then there's no way that anyone is actually underpaid, uh, provided that there's another opportunity for, you know, employment, okay? If there's not, this sort of breaks down. There's nuances to it, which we'll get to, uh, but anyway, this is a basic insight uh, from from the competitive process, right? And this is true, by the way, uh, not just of you know hourly workers and everything. It's true of of managers. It's true of corporate executives, of CEOs, right? So, you know, CEOs that are making hundreds of millions of dollars per year, right? They're not being overpaid because if they were, their company would be losing money, right? Losing money quick, like fast, okay? And so, uh, and so. <clears throat> what I want to stress here, okay, is that this logic applies to all workers, regardless of their salary, regardless of their pay, regardless of anything, right? And it's only true within the context of this model that I have established where there is competition for the worker. If there's not competition for the worker, this model breaks down, okay? And so we'll talk more about what, to what extent, if any, right, if any, which it may not, uh, this this thought here applies to the world, okay? If it does apply, well, then what I said at first is true. No one's underpaid, but also no one's overpaid, right? Uh, if it doesn't apply, then, you know, maybe we've got some room for people being underpaid and overpaid. We'll find out, okay? Uh, but for now, let's just start here. Let's just start with this idea here, and we'll build from that. We'll start here. This will be like our foil that we'll build off of and, and question throughout the semester, okay?